Thank you, Graham. Sarah, will you get us started? Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Entheo Generation, our first time doing this speaker series. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for standing the, the heat of the dome. We're trying to, to get the best way to cool it, um, working on it. So it's actually cooler than it is outside still, so that's, that's good. All right. So welcome. We're here to talk about the Zendo project. And first, I'm going to start um, just by giving a brief introduction to what the Zendo does, what we do here on Playa and elsewhere. So the Zendo project is a peer support space that provides compassionate care and support for people who are having challenging experiences, psychedelic or otherwise, like emotionally challenging experiences as well. And. Uh, do I need to be louder? Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> and what I believe that we really do is we create containers for place, in places where there are not containers. So in so-called recreational or recreational environments. So Rick was just up here talking about psychedelic therapy. And I work, I've been working with MAPS and with Rick for the past seven years doing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Um, in Boulder, Colorado, and then doing this work with the Zendo Project. And so working in both the clinical, medical context, and then in the recreational context. And I see that there's a lot of, that there's a lot that can be learned from both of those areas, and there's a lot of crossover. It's really important, I think, for us to understand that as these medicines get uh, decriminalized, medicalized, legalized, whatever it might be, that that means um, that there is more and more people, and that's what we're seeing in this psychedelic renaissance right now, there's more and more people who are choosing to explore in these realms. And so, and that exploration takes place at festivals, events like Burning Man, and takes place at, um, you know, homes and various environments and various settings. And in a lot of these settings, um, there's not really a container, a place to hold the experience like there might be in a MDMA-assisted or LSD-assisted psychotherapy session in a research context, or like there might be in a ayahuasca or peyote ceremony. So th there, what, what we really do at our core is really attempt to create a container. Our intention is to create a space where people's experiences, the healing experiences that can be catalyzed by the psychedelic, that can surprise people and take people off, off guard, catch people off guard when they come out, especially there's a lot of first time users um, of psychedelics in recreational settings. And um, even if you're not a first time user and you're a veteran explorer, um, we can all, you know, psychedelics are catalysts for healing and so it brings these things up. And if we're intending to do that, and that's why we're choosing to explore with a substance, and that's the intention and that's the container that we're creating, then that's one thing. But if you're in an environment like this and that's not what you intended and this might be your first time and you're exploring, um, or it's just not what the plan you had in mind was, uh, and then you take, say, MDMA or LSD, and some trauma comes up, or that, you know, individual, collective, uh, planetary, generational trauma, whatever it may be, and that arises, as it does with, with these psychedelic medicines, um, there can sometimes be, uh, there's no place to go or people don't know what to do. And so that's where the Zendo comes in, is it's a place where we have volunteers who we train in our principles uh, to be able to hold space and hold a container for people's experiences so that they don't, those difficulties that arise don't get more difficult, right? So it's par for the course for difficulty to arise on a substance, but if you're in an environment that's unpredictable with a lot of different variables, then that difficulty can be exacerbated and um, kind of spiral out. And so a lot of people who we find come to the Zendo, that's why they end up there, is because, um, because of that process. And so um, we will be talking about some of the, but the principles that we use in the Zendo, but I think that at our, at our essence, at our core, the Zendo teaches principles that are, ac are very aligned with archetypes that are common of the psychedelic experience. Unity, oneness, unconditional love, 
compassion, presence, acceptance, non-judgment. These are all common archetypal themes of, psychedelic, of the psychedelic experience. And so at our core, you know, we have all these practices and tools and techniques and ways that we teach our sitters and that we teach each other how to sit for someone, the practice of sitting for someone. And behind all of that, behind all of those tools and that framework is at its core all of these archetypal principles, which I just named. And over the past eight years, so Zender Project was born here at Burning Man in 2012. And MAPS has been doing harm reduction services uh, since the early 2000s uh, here at Burning Man and at other events around the world. And what we've seen over the past really 20 years is an evolution of this compassionate care services, psychedelic peer support. And I um, want to use an analogy. So we were born as Zendo Project, started calling ourselves Zendo Project in 2012. And that was the year, the theme that year was Fertility 2.0. And in that year, so a seed was planted in the fertile soils of the desert playa. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that seed has really grown. Um, our community has really grown to uh, thousands, having trained thousands of volunteers and also training, um, we'll talk about outreach, it's also training thousands of people who haven't necessarily volunteered with us but who are using our um, model to replicate and bring into, and bring into the world. And we've helped over 5,500 individuals in these past eight years alone. That's a lot of people. And our guests and our volunteers and our donors, our supporters, our entire community that have helped to build this village of entheogeneration, um, this camp here, and we have Zen, which was, it's our Zendopod camp. Um, and we are within the village of psychedelic foam home or fomogenesis. And so this, this family here, this community, um, I see it as like that seed got planted in 2012 and then it's grown, it's become a tree with many branches, many flowers and many fruits. And those fruits are producing their own seeds which are then going out and pollinating the world with these core principles of compassion, love, acceptance, unity, non-judgment. And we're seeing, we'll, we'll be talking about, Ryan, we'll be talking about what that looks like in the practical sense. Um, how the teachings and the philosophies of the Zendo Project have, um, have gone into different communities and transformed different communities. But uh, that's kind of the way I see it. I see it as we're at this place right now in metamorphosis where we're like a fully blossomed tree with many branches that are seeding many other trees in a big forest of psychedelic and not just psychedelic but emotional care and support and this might be this might seem lofty but i really think that the model that we provide in the zendo provides a model for the mental health care system which i've worked within for almost a decade now which is really sick our mental health care system is really sick and for those of you who are here at the speaker series um, probably pretty aware of that right and that's why we're looking to these psychedelics as tools and technologies for healing to help transform a system that has been broken for a long time. Um, so it's not the people, it's not, it's not the people that are broken, it is a, a system that has been created through, um, through old patterns, through old programming. And we're working to help create a new grid, right, a new system of um, new programming based in love and not based in fear. And um, so, yeah, we're hoping to continue to grow a forest with you all. We intend to continue to create a forest with you all. And I'm going to pass it on to Ryan, who's going to talk more about the far kind of reaching um, effects of the Zendo Project effect, I guess. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, I just want to back up a little bit and give some context to why the two of us are here and why we run the Zendo. Uh, Sarah is a MDMA PTSD therapist on the study in Boulder. She's been doing that for seven years now, is that correct? And 
I come to this work through my own psychotic break. Ten years ago, I went down, I had a uh, dieta in Peru. It took me about a month and a half to finish the psychotic break, and I only made it home successfully because I had an amazing community of support to catch me. It took me another three to four months to actually integrate back into consensus reality, and for years, I just thought that I had lost and you know, embarrassed myself. And it wasn't until I discovered Zendo that I discovered a deeper purpose of how we can help people home from those experiences that can be otherwise so disturbing or disconnecting or unfamiliar and help to bring the gifts from those scary experiences in a way that can help us to grow and make a better world together. So uh, the, the way that we bring our peer support services is, you know, and, and Apologize, first off, we had a, a really great set of graphics up here that somehow got lost with our internet connection, but um, so pay no attention to the graphs, they're completely meaningless. Um, but our four principles of psychedelic support are safe space, sitting not guiding, talking through not down, and difficult is not the same as bad. Uh, next slide. And our plan on delivering that is showing up at festivals and showing how effective that can be. And as Sarah talked about, a lot of folks come to these events with the idea that a psychedelic experience is gonna be positive, it's gonna be fun, and it's gonna be recreational. And it's not uncommon that the folks that come to us have some sort of trauma or repressed emotions that have no other choice but to come up in these situations. And what we're giving them is nothing more than the safe space to allow the entire arc of that to be experienced and to get through the other side safely. So the timeline we have, this blank number one, two, and three. Um, again, apologies on our, our missing slides. We don't need it. Okay, so anyway. Um, is right now the last eight years of this growth of this beautiful tree has been proving the effectiveness of this, proving that integrated services with medical and with security and law enforcement are actually a good thing. And what we have found across the board is the feedback that we get from medical services, that we get from security and especially law enforcement is thank you for showing up. These are people that we don't have the time and energy to deal with, so thank you for being there so we can pass the folks that are not part of our triage onto you guys, because the reality is a lot of our situations take hours of work. And when you think about what, you know, whether it's a law enforcement officer or a medical person, it's triage. They're trying to address a situation and get through it as quickly as possible so they can be available for the next situation. For us, we're willing to take people for four hours, eight hours, 24, 48, whatever is necessary. So the next step of what we found with the effectiveness is that we are looking to the leaders in our community and looking to be leaders ourselves. So with our training, we found that we bring a essence of public training that has been delivered for years, specifically through trainings at Burning Man and other events. Over the last, I think, four years, we've done trainings in New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh, uh, Portland, Seattle, with plans to do some in Los Angeles, Colorado, with plans to do some in Los Angeles and San Francisco in the coming years. And we're seeing that the effectiveness of moving past the festival slice of the pie and making ourselves available online is really the growth that's available in this. We're also seeing the operations of what can be passed on is that there's an opportunity for us to share with other grassroots organizations our successes and failures in a way that we can all learn from. We've learned that, especially from this event right here and running a site at three o'clock and nine o'clock, the amount of effort that it takes to show up with all of these resources and continue the logistics and operations of two sites at Burning Man over the course of a week is a lot. And that we don't necessarily see that the effectiveness of the work of Zendo Project is showing up at 40 more events throughout the year. But what we are excited about is the fractal and mycelial nature of inspiring other grassroots organization to bring their own version of peer support. 
and to be able to pass on a model of this is what's worked for us with fundraising, this is what's worked with us for volunteer coordination, for operations, so they're not having to reinvent the wheel. We really are excited about passing this gift that we've developed over the last eight years of our incarnation and, and our operations on to the next generation. And the huge thing that we've seen, again, is, is something I've already hit, is this integration between all of the services that are out there. We've been very clear that our scope of service when it comes to things like suicidal ideation, domestic violence, uh, psychotic breaks, is something that, say again? and sexual assault is something that we are willing to be the first point of contact for, but then we want to pass to more professional folks. Here at Burning Man and at other festivals, there's a crisis intervention team. And those are the folks that deal with suicidal ideation, sexual assault, domestic violence, and su suicidal ideation. Did I say that twice? I'm sorry. Other things that are not as peer support. Right, medical, things like that. So, and, and again, it's become very appreciated by the production and safety teams. And the next step that we're really excited about, and we're gonna spend the next 20 some odd minutes talking about, is the outreach and the future of what we see available for psychedelic peer support. Because what we have seen is this model of psychedelic peer support is bigger than what we think of as supporting a drug experience. When we first started this work in 2012, we saw that about 80 or 90% of, of the guests coming in were on drugs. Nowadays, it's around 40 to 50%. So we're helping people through emotional crisis, breakup, uh, sleep deprivation, having problems with people in camp. We're just a place that we can allow strangers to come and be helped by other strangers in the challenges of just being a human in this day and age. And I think as we all are aware, it's not necessarily an easy time to be alive. I think we're really excited about what is available and on the horizon with psychedelics, with regenerative technology, but I think we're, we're coming over that blip. We're coming over that hill and we're making some big progress. Yeah, and I'll add to that that I think that it's really important that as these as these substances and as these medicines become more and more prolific in all different types of settings, whether it's ceremonial, recreational, therapeutic, that we really have a balanced view of the, the risks that are associated with psychedelics as well. And we, we think that that's something that really didn't happen in the 60s, right? And that was a huge, um, a lot of the backlash, yes, there was you know, government control and we don't want people to free their minds, we don't want them to think for themselves, there was that. And then there was also a lot of minimization of the, uh, the risks that are associated with psychedelic use. And today, unlike the 60s, those risks are even higher higher because there's so much you know, adulterants, not a lot of things are pure, um, or so, sorry, I'll rephrase that. There's a lot of impurities out there in substances. There's a lot of, because of prohibition and because of decriminalization, which has pushed these substances um, to the point where people have needed to find new and novel ways to create different chemicals. Um, it's, it's a different world out there than it was in the 60s. And a lot of our volunteers who you know, are uh, the generation who grew up at that time, it's really surprising and they often share that to see just like the, you know, obviously the alphabet soup out there and like it is, um, it's both beautiful to see the emergence of, um, of new uh, molecular entities that have benefits in themselves, just like MDMA, right? So we're not like saying uh, synthesized, you know, plant versus synthesized, uh, but we are saying that there's a lot of uh, shadiness going on out there, a lot of things that are sold as one thing when in fact there's something else. So um, Mitchell will be coming up and talking after us, so know your, know your dose, know your drug. He'll be talking about testing and dance safe's work doing harm reduction. But um, so I'll just say that, you know, a lot of the, the fear and the stigma that currently exists is a result of um, a lack of understanding 
And that lack of understanding has a lot of roots in the backlash that we experienced in the 60s. So I think it's really important that if we're going to be doing, we have to be really responsible and really careful of how we balance the conversation around the excitement of the benefits of psychedelics. And we balance that with a real honest and responsible conversation around the risks so that we can actually address those risks and mitigate them. Yeah, and I, I, to, to give this bigger overview, this movement, we believe, is truly a world changer. The, the psychedelic mindset and what the psychedelic stands for, as Sarah was talking about in the beginning, is about connection, is about oneness, is about reconnecting to the natural world, reconnecting to, to community, to humans being humans again. We believe that the hardware that we have inherited in these amazing human bodies is top notch. And that we just have had some bad programming in the past. And we are currently upgrading the operating system by not just doing psychedelics, but doing psychedelics in a supported way. Because we've seen that the psychedelic use without the proper container can lead to some really egoic and maybe misinformed outcomes that don't have the proper integration. And if we look a little bit deeper into the resources of everything from, you know, how to properly integrate with community, making beautiful visionary art, music, uh, regenerative technology and nature, a lot of these things, I believe, have come through psychedelic roots, through people that have explored, with or without substances, alternative ways of looking into a problem and coming out with a different solution. So one of the things that we are taking from this is a lot of mentoring. We've gotten our mentoring from decades, if not you know, thousands of years of indigenous wisdom passed down through ayahuasca and peyote ceremonies that have informed us how to better hold space for folks that are looking to find transformation and healing. And especially with what you know, Rick was talking about with these MDMA studies, we're seeing that there is an amazing potential for healing trauma. And I believe that so much of the challenges that we're experiencing on this planet right now are a result of trauma being passed down. Is that your mic or is that a singing bowl? That's a singing bowl, apparently. Sounded like it. Uh -huh. All right. We might need to adjust it. So th this idea that our, our ability to find deeper connection and deeper resonance through mentors through community is really at the heart of this movement that we can't do this alone, I think is, is the biggest piece of what both Burning Man and this movement of the psychedelic renaissance really stands for. You wanna hit it? So in here we just have a few you know, things about innovation. You know, and, and I think that's really one of the pieces that we have taken away from eight years of going to places like Africa Burn and Boom and seeing how this can work in models where people are just starting up a sanctuary at a regional burn or going to Boom and, and being able to deal with something where there is a post-prohibitionist world where drugs are decriminalized and testing is part of the process of the festival. Yeah. Who's been to Boom? Awesome. Yeah, so a whole new world. Um, MAPS was really part of the growing of the Cosmicare, which is now known as Psycare there at Boom. And it's just really recommend to go and experience it if you're interested in this kind of work to look to maybe volunteer in that environment because it's really uh, beautiful to see how what you can do in that uh, pro prohibitionist kind of environment. Yeah. And, you know, and the other piece I just want to hit on here, you know, the, the one that says feedback loops with two-way interface. I think one of the biggest things that this community needs right now because we are playing on this really gray area of where is the regulation for things like the underground therapy or going down to Peru and getting into ayahuasca tourism is how do we have everything from restorative justice to the peer review of this is a good shaman or guide that is giving the proper ways to not only go through these journeys but integrate and how do we help those folks that have maybe unintentionally 
taken the shadow of their egos and caused more trauma to people, whether that's through sexual violation or manipulation or power plays. I don't believe that we can do that without the inclusion of everyone. This movement, I believe, requires making relationship with all things, including those things that we really don't want to make relationship with, that we would rather outcast and shun. And I think there's an important distinction between having a boundary and turning our backs and allowing the shadow to consume. And I'm going to just share this one thing that I did from our training yesterday. So sorry about the redundancy if you were there, but I believe this movement of making relationship, as the Lakota say, Ho Matakuyasin, all my relations, is about inviting all of those shadows to our round table. That those shadows are warriors that have been lost and forgotten how to serve because they haven't had the purpose that we have accidentally lost and outcast. We've relegated them to the deep forest or to the dungeon. And I believe once we invite them back to our round table and we knight them once again and we give them the service and the purpose that we can have a fully integrated parts within ourselves that are here to serve, that are here to change the world, that are here to make powerful movement forward with those things that have been taboo, that we have not been able to talk about, are not been able to look at. I think once we fully heal those things, we have the opportunity to model what that change looks like on a global level and move past these military conflicts and war around ideology and religion that are simply misunderstandings of these shadows that are coming together to clash an arena that really just want to dance with one another. They want to do this beautiful dance and we've given them weapons. So if we can disarm them and allow them to see that this thing that they've come together in the arena to do is actually to inspire more beauty in this world. I think we're in as a community going to come away inspired and reunited with our vision of why we're here and the gifts we're here to share. Yeah, and I think to to speak to that a couple pieces. So the Zenda project model, right, we create this environment that has these archetypes that we talked about in the beginning. But, you know, a lot of times for those of you who, you know, who haven't been in the Zendo or haven't volunteered, a lot of people ask like, you know, well, what does it look like? And to piggyback off of what you were saying in relation to these parts, right, these shadow parts that show up, we are creating an environment where everything is welcome. And these parts that show up and, and come to the forefront in people's personalities and things that people might say or um, that uh, emotions that are expressed that don't feel acceptable out there in the world or out there at an event, that the Zendo is a safe place for those emotions and those thoughts to be expressed. However, we also are a place of setting boundaries, right? So there's also, um, you know, there's, there's like a, it's okay to be angry right now, and no, you can't punch Ryan. <laughs> it's okay to be angry right now, and no, you can't burn down the village, right? So it's acknowledging emotions and deep shadow while also holding boundaries around behavior. And uh, we had one of our friends and volunteer friends um, in camp who said, you know, I came to your training, and it sounded like a lot of tools on how to work with children. It's a very similar kind of model of like you acknowledge the emotion but and the, the um, underlying intentions and the underlying fears or things that are coming up, but then you also create boundaries around behavior. And this harkens back to what you were speaking to around community behavior, right? So I think that the Zendo Project models a way of being in relationship with psychedelics, a sitter psychedelic, uh, sitter guest relationship, whether that's a sitter like a therapist with a client, or that's a sitter like a shaman with someone who's in their ceremony, is that we are all at our core is a, a lot of ethics and integrity. So we really have, um, we train our volunteers in principles of ethics and how to hold space in, in terms of confidentiality, consent, touch, non-sexual interaction, right? All of these ways. And the other way that we we do this is we do it in community, right? So people are offering, we're offering this service in the open in a space with sitters all being there 
with each other, with leadership who's been doing this work for a while, who is um, you know, really helping to hold that container. So we hope that our model can provide, um, can, can provide support for models that are not necessarily psychedelic peer support, but that are other, um, other environments where psychedelics might be used and to bring some of those ethical principles that we've found to be really just just like the, the skeleton, like really important bones of this work because you can bring in all the tools and all of the um, insights and all of the breath work and art and all different practices that you might use with somebody in that state, but if you don't have a backbone of ethics to guide you, um, then you know, then you're lost. And we're always learning, we're consistently learning as a community, like what are these boundaries, right? What are these ethics? Annie here will be <laughs> speaking to that um, later on today. So, like, you know, what are these um, ethical guidelines? And they're constantly evolving and they're constantly changing as they should be, right? So the things that were ethical a decade ago, we recognize now are like, oh, okay, that wasn't cool. We're not going to do that anymore. <laughs> you know, so it's ideally we're all growing and learning and evolving and learning through um, through our failures, through our mistakes as a community um, and growing from those and, and you know, learning how to um, how to make repair and how to set boundaries. And so a lot of the work that we do with our guests is applicable to, um, to it, like you said, it's a fractal, right? It's applicable to so many other uh, environments within the psychedelic world. Can we back up one slide? Is that possible? I don't know if we've done it. Yeah, awesome. Um, so as we look towards the future of Zendo Project and compassionate care, we're seeing that we're going to be able to make a lot more impact with global videos, with global online training. And I say global, I mean online, that then can become a deeper way for us to show up in person and do this stuff globally. Um, we, we've put this out in, in kind of a, you know, maybe not joking, but like idealistic world that maybe someday Zendo Project can show up to refugee camps and uh, natural disasters and set up tents to help peer support for people that have lost everything in a hurricane or that have been outcast from their country and had to walk thousands of miles to find refuge in a, a safe place. Because we believe that although these core philosophies and principles have been inspired by the psychedelic state, that they're at their core applicable to all states of trauma and challenge of the human experience. And so the idea that we can continue to innovate and adapt to meet the changing needs of this world, that we are wanting to make this invitation bigger than psychedelics. And so I leave you all with this. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah for her final words. But I'd like to invite you all, as you go out into the world and you bring back your experience of Burning Man or your psychedelic epiphanies, that you bring it in a way that can be felt and heard and maybe even digested by those that you want to share them with. And I've learned in this work, there's something really amazing about being able to camouflage in a certain situation. I used to have my top knot. I used to run around barefoot with a bunch of kids. And I found that the more I interfaced with law enforcement, it helped to cut my hair short. It helped to wear maybe a collared shirt every now and then so that they think I'm one of them. They, they, there's just that amazing thing of like, oh, you look like me. I can hear what you have to say. And I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting you change who you are on the inside, but there's something we can do about how we change our appearance and our interface with those that may be in conflict with our ideology. And I would invite you, if you're so inclined, to be able to present your story to somebody who's maybe a little bit resistant as somebody else's. I heard about this guy and he went and he did this thing at Burning Man and it changed his life. And this was his story. What do you think about that? You'll find that there's so much more receptivity and bandwidth that can happen when we step outside of our own experience and try to present it as a way of influencing someone, but just rather throwing the seeds into the garden 
and knowing where they're going to grow and where they're not, and then nurturing that garden from there. Yeah, so last words, Inter integration. And then I want to take some questions, because Mitchell said we could cut a little bit into his, a uh, li little bit. Yeah, cool. Um, so uh, integration is a big hot word right now. <laughs> it's really important. It's, it's really uh, at least half of the, um, the formula here. So w in the Zendo, we work and help people integrate their experiences. But um, we're not going to talk about how we necessarily do that right now. But what I do want to speak to is that um, integrating this work out into the community. So we kind of have joked in the past that one of our intentions, and someone was saying this when during Rick's talk, was about psychotherapy, like making itself obsolete, right? Like the purpose of healing work is to no longer, you know, to put yourself out of business. And I think that as a therapist, you know, I do this healing work and ideally I'm losing clients, not gaining them because people are like, all right, I'm good. <laughs> um, and so for this, it's like how, Ideally, what we're wanting to do, and this is why we have our trainings open to the public. We had our training yesterday in the foam dome, and there was maybe 400 volunteers and then another 100 people from the public, is because we want to teach these tools to everyone, people who volunteer with us or not, so that they can take these out and work with people one-on-one. -on -one. So even if you're not working within a peer support organization, that we're able to take care of each other as a community. So and one day, instead of like, oh, take that person to the Zendo, it's just like everyone around is just like, oh yeah, bam. <laughs> as David Bronner would say. Um, I know how to work with that. I can do that. Yeah, I went to that Zendo project training. or I went to that peer support training. I know what to do, right? So that we create a safe space that isn't just a container or a yurt, a space, but it is an entire community where we are creating safety for one another, right? Um, so I think that that is like the integration of this work. And... Um, and yeah, no, I'd like to open it up to some, some questions. Can I give people a mic? Right. What are the requirements for people to get involved with the Zendo? Uh, no, so in order to get involved with the Zendo, that's a great question. Um, the question is, you know, what background you have to have to be involved in the Zendo. So we have an application process. Um, it's on, if you go to our website on zendoproject.org, there's stickers being passed out somewhere. Um, and if you go to zendoproject.org, volunteer, it, uh, it'll show you all the ways to get involved. And essentially, we have an application process where people, we ask very specific questions. You don't have to have a background in, in uh, mental health. We're not offering, we're not doing therapy, we're not doing mental health services. What we do is peer support. It's one of the beautiful things about the work that we do is because we think that these principles and teachings are simple. They're complex. Um, and they're, they take skill to implement, but they're also simple at their core. And there's really a lot of um, coming back to just learning how to, you know, grounding and connect and be present with another individual. So we have volunteers from all different kinds of um, backgrounds. And it really is about the, you know, when you apply, it's like the, the strength of the answers to the questions and the application. Um, and then, yeah, different backgrounds. We definitely do have a mix and we look for a mix of different backgrounds. So if you do work in mental health or in um, uh, similar fields and healing fields, then that's also great. So there's, there's no particular, I mean, there's some exclusionary things, but um, there's not like a main inclusion criteria. Yeah, we take it every individual at a time. Hi. Hi. Um, in your goal of expanding the outreach of the Sando uh, in other countries, are you interested in like finding leaders that you have trained? And so that's, that's a chance, a real chance? Yeah, yeah. So we're working right now on some grassroots training programs. So the way that it currently looks is that we do provide a lot of leaders in other countries will reach out to us if they're interested in creating their own type of organization. Um, and then they, we will provide consultation and trainings for those organizations or those, those individuals. And um, we're right now doing, Ryan was talking about our um, 
our outreach, we're doing a fundraiser right now. We're really looking to raise funds for scholarships for um, marginalized communities because a lot of times we really want, uh, like these services aren't being brought to, um, similar to the conversation around it, uh, the research, right, MDMA and psychedelic research. We really want to bring these services to as many communities as possible. So we have worked with um, individuals and organizations in different countries and lo we're looking to do more of that in the coming years. And then they create their own entity that's called something different than the Zendo Project, but they have a background in like the Zendo Project training. Yeah. Uh, a great example of that is Queer Dome right now, which is on Playa, the uh, address, oh shoot, um, <laughs> I should know this, six o'clock, and anyone here from Queer Dome? Um, all right, anyway, Queer Dome on the map, find them, six o'clock and something, and um, they are a group of folks um, who wanted to get together and um, create peer support services specifically for the LGBTQ community, and they came to our training. Um, a lot of their volunteers have worked with us before, and so they're taking um, our principles and teachings and they're bringing them to their um, community here because they really felt like it was important for people in that community to feel like they had um, an extra place that they could go to that had that extra layer of people who really understood their experience, right? And so, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, that is one of our really big goals, is to bring this out to as many communities as possible. We're working on that. So if you or someone you know is interested, just reach out to us um, at zendo at maps.org and let us know what your story is and what you're working on, and, and we'll find a way to work together. Thanks. So I, I, I'm thinking about Denver and places like Denver. Um, and we talked about this a little bit when I, when I was out visiting, but you know, I'm remembering when Colorado legalized cannabis, there were lots of people who, who, who were inexperienced and who had really bad experiences and ended up in the ER and all that sort of thing. So, um, so my question really is, um, now that psilocybin has been decriminalized in the city of Denver, um, are you seeing that? And, and, and even if you're not seeing it yet, like what's your vision for a really good harm reduction infrastructure for Denver, for Oakland, and I assume the dozens of other cities that are gonna follow in this path in the near future? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. So it's such in its infancy and um, you know, even though we were foreseeing decrim in Oakland and in Denver, it kind of took us by surprise in a really good way. And uh, so it just happened this year and we um, have been involved in, you know, we do other events, not just Burning Man and education and outreach. And so we are kind of like, whoa, okay, we got a hustle now um, in terms of the, the outreach of people in the community who worked on the initiatives as well as people in the public health sector uh, who were reaching out to us and saying, you know, we'd love to get your, um, your advice, your expertise, your eyes on uh, how to create uh, safer, um, safer systems in the, the medical arena, security, law enforcement, things like that. So, um, you know, we have trained people in the different emergency service fields, and that's one of the things that we plan to do with DCRIM is making sure that our train, I mean, there are so many people um, in those sectors who are really interested in bringing in our teachings, and so there's people, you know, there's these little seeds that live in all those sectors that are like, oh yeah, I happen to be the chief officer at, uh, you know, I mean, can't name names, but like there's some like some pretty uh, high up there uh, in the legal, in the um, uh, law enforcement system, in the judicial system, who've reached out to us and said, "Hey, we need you. Our officers they don't want to do this heavy-handed approach." And <laughs> one of them used a term that I'd never heard before, which was "cuff and stuff." <laughs> it's like, we don't want to do this cuff and stuff stuff anymore. We want, to, we want to work with people. We want to understand what's going on with them, and we want to help talk to them. And this is, you know, these are coming from officers who are like, they're, they're sick of being in conflict with people. They're sick of getting and escalating a situation unknowingly, not knowing how to deal with it. And we believe that a lot of the ways that, you know, restraint, sedation, arrest, and unnecessary psychiatric hospitalizations that cause trauma, that can cause trauma, um, those are often, sure, they're, they're based in the stigma and they're based in people's own 
beliefs about psychedelics. Some people just don't understand. Some officers, medics uh, in those fields just don't get it, right? So a lot of people are actually really hungry um, to understand and to learn how to implement these types of practices in their own industries. So that's really our focus right now, is working with the people who are working on the initiatives themselves um, and integrating with their vision, as well as working with the policy makers and, um, and yeah, the other emergency service professionals in those, in those cities. So thanks, Graham. I have a question. Yeah. Well, yeah, yes. <laughs> As the um, <clears throat> decrim initiatives and the ongoing therapeutic and medical initiatives uh, unfold, do you find that due to the su success of these initiatives, people are a little less cautious about their discretion in talking about their drug experiences online or on the phone or via text or a little less cautious? in terms of law enforcement um, potentials. Oh. Oh. <laughs> One of the few statistics that I've heard, um, I, I don't know, I love that question. I, I want to explore more, and I hope you'll address some in your talk, Annie. Um, one of the interesting stats that I've heard that is the only big measurable stat uh, in Colorado that has happened is the use of cannabis has actually decreased a little bit in the younger population, but where it is markedly increased is amongst senior citizens. So I think taking away that taboo of, hey, this is illegal, I can use this, I can enjoy myself, work with arthritis, other pain, that's actually the one stat that they have seen markedly increase. And I, I, I believe personally, from the conversations we've had with Zendo, there is a little bit more freedom of people being able to say, now that this is decriminalized, I'm willing to have this conversation as a business person or as a teacher where I could not, or, or even as a parent, as a mother or father, that I would not be willing to have with all these laws in place that could mean that my kid could get snatched from me or I could lose my job. So I think we are seeing some positivity around it and I think as a community, there's a lot of wonderful opportunity of how we move forward. So we're gonna wrap up now. Uh, let's have a big round of applause for Ryan and Sarah and Zendo. Thank you so much. <laughs>